Hi, my name is Anita Novak, and I'm the author of this book. Welcome to season 11 of Purposeful Empathy, a show that is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. Welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today, I am joined by Dr. Richard Weisbord, who is a senior lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Kennedy School of Government. His work focuses on moral development, the nature of hope, mental health challenges among teens and young adults, and effective schools and services for children facing risks. He directs the Making Caring Common Project, a national effort to make moral and social development priorities in child raising and to provide strategies to schools and parents for promoting in children caring, a commitment to justice and other key moral and social capabilities. He also leads an initiative to reform college admissions called Turning the Tide, which seeks to elevate ethical character, reduce excessive achievement pressure and increase equity and access in the college admissions process. You do such important work. Welcome to the show, Rick. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. I mean, uh, I'm delighted to chat with you because I actually came across your work while doing research for my book. Um, I was writing a chapter about how families and communities can practice purposeful empathy. And that's how I came to learn about the Making Caring Common Project and a report that was published called The Children We Mean to Raise, which is a great title. Um, I'm going to include a link in the website or to your website in the description below because I really recommend uh, parents, educators, anyone listening to download the report. It's a great read. And you also did a great job of just sort of summarizing the key takeaways. I want to just read a little um, snippet from your website um, and invite you to, to comment on this. So according to our national survey, a large majority of youth across a wide spectrum of races, cultures, and classes appear to value aspects of personal success, so achievement and happiness, over concern for others. At the root of this problem may be a gap between what parents say are their top priorities and the real messages they convey in their behavior on a day-to-day -day basis. When children do not prioritize caring and fairness or think their friends don't, there's a lower bar for many forms of harmful behavior, including cruelty, disrespect, honesty, and cheating. And then you say, or the, it, the website reads, the good news is that we have found substantial evidence that caring and fairness still counts among kids. And according to other sources, also among adults, great news. The solution is straightforward if we're all willing to work together, which is like the 64,000 question, what's the solution? So, you know, what we're trying to make the case for is that we really need to put caring for others, caring about justice front and center in child raising again, that we've elevated achievement and happiness and demoted, in a sense, concern for others, concern for the common good. And I think there's a range of things that parents can do and schools can do and the media can do and college admissions can do all to elevate uh, caring for others more. I mean, you know, as parents, you know, one simple thing is like, rather than saying to kids all the time, the most important thing is that you're happy. What if we said to them, the most important thing is that you're kind. Mm -hmm. William James said there's three things that matter most in life. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. The third is to be kind. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's also in, in the day-to-day -day messages that we send to our kids. You know, if we don't require them to reach out to friendless kids on the playground, or if we don't require them to write thank you notes, or if we don't encourage them to pass the ball in a game, in all these ways, we prioritize their happiness over their caring for others. And parents say that they prioritize caring for others, but it's not expressed in their day-to-day -day actions. So part of this is matching parents' rhetoric with the reality of what they're doing day-to-day -day. for all of us as parents to really think about these day-to-day -day messages and what they're conveying to kids. Mm. I also imagine that modeling behavior is probably a, a very uh, useful thing to do if you want to inculcate that in your children. Absolutely. I would say modeling is critical. And, you know, modeling, not just empathy for people you care about or people in your family or your close circle of friends, but empath modeling empathy for people who may not be in those circles, people from a different race or religion or political orientation. 
but also the school custodian, the bus driver, a server in a restaurant that, you know, modeling for your kids that those people um, merit our appreciation and they're doing things that, that are important in our lives. Um, you know, that kind of modeling is important. Expecting to, expecting your kids to appreciate the server, the custodian, the, the bus driver, expecting your kids to say thank you and express gratitude. Um, expecting your kids when they're busy to be respectful with your friends. I mean, all these are ways that, you know, expect, having high expectations of our kids are, is important. And developing the reflexes too. You know, when kids, um, you know, there's a debate about whether kids should do chores in this country. I think it's a kind of a crazy debate. Kids should do chores. You know, kids should pitch in. They should help. They should help around the house. They should help neighbors. That's how you develop a family identity, a reflex, a habit of caring for other people. I mean, that's how it becomes part of who you are. So I think habits are really important. Practice is really important. Expectations are important. And modeling is also really important. Mm. I wonder, is, um, is there anything that from your life uh, or lived experiences that uh, you can speak about that has taken you down this path? Like, I'm just curious to know what your motivation is behind all this work. Well, you, I was primarily motivated when because when my kids were young, I felt like I was very aware that I was in a parenting environment that was very focused on happiness and i'm in a middle upper middle upper class white community primarily white um and you know a, a parenting environment that's very focused on happiness and achievement and and i saw parents um hyper focused on how their kids were feeling moment to moment but not very attentive sometimes to how other kids were feeling i saw you know a huge amount of pressure to go to a selective college um to get good grades, to rack up long brag sheets for your college resume. And again, not a whole lot of priority on caring for other people. And, you know, I think the, the kicker in this, the irony of this is that if kids learn to tune in and care about other people, they're going to have better relationships their whole lives mm -hmm. and they're going to be happier. And yeah. so, um, you know, there's a way in which focusing just on your kids moment to moment happiness can deprive them of exactly those capacities that are so important for their long-term well-being mm -hmm. um i'll just say one other thing quickly about that i don't think we should tell kids to be caring though because it'll make them happy and we do that a lot in our culture we should tell people to be caring because it's the right thing to do mm -hmm. we should tell kids to be moral to be moral not because it's going to make them happy in the end mm -hmm. why sage advice um my, my daughter is seven and she's coming home with these little sheets of paper from her school that are all to help build sort of SEL, social emotional learning skills. And, you know, she did one day where she was focused on anger and one day focused on kindness. And I love the fact that the school is teaching that. Um, but I, 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 I really, I really appreciate your comment. So let me ask this um, question, very basic question about, you know, how do you define empathy and why do you think it's so important? So uh... I would define empathy, I, th I think it's important to think about the cognitive aspect of empathy, the, the emotional aspect of empathy, and the ethical aspect of empathy. I think sometimes when we talk about empathy, we were talking about walking in someone else's shoes or perspective taking. Mm -hmm. Con men and torturers and salespeople and politicians can be very good at taking other perspectives. Um, they don't value other people. Torturers can even, and politicians can be good at experiencing what other people feel, but they don't value other people. So I think we want kids to have the cognitive aspect of empathy, the ability to take other perspectives, but also the emotional aspect, the ability to experience what people feel, and the ethical aspect, the ability to appreciate other people or value other people. Mm -hmm. So I think of empathy as having all, all those components. And I think of empathy as so important for close relationships, for being a good citizen in the world, uh, for love and learning how to have a, a really flourishing romantic relationship, you know, a vibrant, wonderful romantic relationship. Um, and I also think of empathy, and particularly empathy for people who are different from you, as the foundation of justice. Hmm. Um, 
you know, if you can empathize with the diverse people in your community or in your country, you can represent those in, their diverse interests in decisions um, about justice and fairness. Uh, if you don't have that empathy, you can't represent their interests. Uh, so I think empathy is, you know, a, a key cornerstone of of a, of a sense of justice. Yeah. Mm. And I also think it's empathy. I'm sorry. I also think it's empathy that motivates people to pursue justice often too. Oh, I'm 100% in agreement with you. The reason, the way I, my pathway to empathy was not, I thought, oh, empathy is so great. Let me just study that. I actually was in the faculty of education at McGill doing my PhD and I interviewed social entrepreneurs, uh, people who were devoting their time and their talent and their energy to solving some of the major social problems of the world. And I was doing just typical narrative interviews, trying to understand what they did in their lives and if they had common things. Um, and through the interviews, dozens of interviews, like with different people working on different social problems, it all was distilled down to this idea that they saw people who were suffering in some way or in pain or, or hurting marginalized. They felt a sense of empathy and they felt uh, they needed to act on it. So I call that, you know, the empathic action. And I mm -hmm. think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, no, it is. It is. I think it's one of the big things that propels action. And, and action, you know, at the individual level or, or in interpersonal relationships, but also action in the larger world. And, you know, action that when you can feel empathy for people who are affected by a tornado or a hurricane in some other part of the world or a tsunami or... Um, or train wreck, whatever it is. I mean, it's really critical to your being a global citizen and, um, and contributing to the world in important ways. Hey, I don't mean to interrupt a great conversation. I just want to draw attention to the fact that there are over 120 equally awesome conversations of my podcast and YouTube series on my channel. Please subscribe. The world needs more empathy and you have a role to play. So we talked earlier about how, you know, we can, the, some different strategies that families can use in the home to elevate care and concern. What do you, do you have any ideas about how schools and families could try to elevate empathy? Is it the same idea? Uh, it's roughly, you know, I think it's overlapping ideas. So we really we didn't talk about schools much. You know, in schools, I think, particularly at this moment, um, but at all times, when we have so many kids who are suffering from mental health problems of one kind or another, um, and not just in adolescence, younger kids too who are struggling. Uh, you know, a lot of attention to adolescence recently, but I think it's a bigger problem than that. And when there's so many kids who have been disconnected from school, that helping kids feel connected to each other and feel connected to adults and feel connected to a school community, feel a sense of belonging is, is really critical. And like everyone else, I want kids to catch up who have had you know really bad learning losses during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I don't think a lot of kids can get there if they don't feel safe and connected and anchored to trusting, caring relationships. So I think help, helping kids developing empathy is also really important for them to feel connected and feel a sense of belonging um, in, in a school community. And there are strategies that you can do. You know, we have a circle of concern exercise that a lot of our schools do. We have an exercise called Humans of Your School, where you sort of do a bio or an art project about someone who you don't know, who has been invisible to you, that's intended to expand your circle of concern. We have lots of games and activities that, um, that teachers can do to, to build empathy in, in school settings. Um, and, you know, they're, they're attentive, these exercises, to the cognitive, affective, and ethical aspects of empathy. And how can people gain access to that? They... They're on the Making Care in Common website. They're, they're, they're free. They're open access. So. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, okay, so let's think of higher ed right now. I'm, I was really key, like really interested when I discovered that you're also involved in turning the tide. So I teach undergrads and I have seen, you just mentioned mental health being a problem. I've watched it deteriorate over the past decade. Um, that's why I think this turning the tide is such an exciting initiative. So I'd love to hear about your big dream 
uh, and also to find out whether or not there's like an appetite right now, or are, is there openness or resistance to it? Because you're, you're at Harvard, you're at like, you know, one of the best universities on the planet where families have got from like in the womb, a track for the kids to be on and all the pressure to get into a school like Harvard. I have many students of mine that want to go there. Uh, I applied. Uh, so I just wonder if like, what, what's the plan? What's the big dream? So, you know, I think there are three dreams with, with turning the tide, you know, one of them, and this is the one that's most important to me is to have greater equity in the college admissions process that right now it's wildly skewed toward more, toward more educated and more affluent kids. Um, and, you know, in terms of preparation for SATs, types of school they go to, help with essays, all those things, um, extracurricular activities, and it's unfair. And you know, even things like community service, you know, there are a lot of kids who are taking care of sick, low-income kids who are taking care of sick relatives or supervising a younger sibling or working 20 hours a week, and they're getting Bs and Cs, and that's really impressive, and it doesn't get captured on their college application. They're not gonna get into a highly selective college, and that's really bad. So a lot of what we're trying to do is to level the playing field, to, to, to create a, a system that is more fair to low-income students, marginalized students. The second dream is that, you know, right now, I think kids are getting a really strong message that the number of academic accomplishments that you have is really important. And whether you're a good person or not is, eh, mm. kind of, maybe it'll help you a little bit. <laughs> and you know, look where we are as a country. And I mean, the US, not Canada, we're a mess. I mean, we are um, hyperpolarized, fractured at each other's throats, individualism, hyper individualism, sort of out of control. And our key adult institutions, including college admissions, have to send a much stronger signal that ethical character really matters. It really matters, you know, in terms of getting into Harvard or other places, that you're a good person. And so, that's one of the things that we're trying to change too. And the third is the thing that I think you were pointing to, which is the crazy amount of achievement pressure in many communities and how bent out of shape many kids are. It's fueling a lot of anxiety and depression in those communities and how you tone that down. So we're working with the Common App, you know, which um, is the primary vehicle for applying to college in the U.S. And, you know, I don't, you know, we're trying to do things like at least think about, you know, can you limit the number of extracurricular activities that kids can report? Um, I would love, we're not talking to the Common App about this, but I would love for colleges to limit the number of AP courses kids can report because you got a bunch of kids who are taking 12 or 15 AP courses and it's just gotten crazy. And, you know, all these things work like a contagion. If you feel like other kids in your school are taking 10 AP courses, you feel like you're not going to get into a college you want to go to if you don't take 10 AP courses. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that when kids and parents can't are not regulating themselves, that institutions have to do some of the regulation for them. And I think college admissions is one institution that can do some of that regulating. Do you predict that they will? Because I feel that there's, you know, such a um, systemically uh, the incentive around legacy giving and the right kind of, you know, kids to have in the in the school is a disincentive to to making some changes like you're describing. It's a great it's a great question. I think that uh, I can tell you that in my conversation with admissions officers and folks at the coalition app and the common app that things are moving in the right direction they're not moving as fast as i would like but they are moving in the right direction i also think that it's going to be really hard when affirmative action is overturned and i think affirmative action will be overturned it's going to be really hard to justify not giving preference to kids who have come from historically oppressed and marginalized backgrounds and giving preference to wealthy kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's going to be very stark. And I think there will be increasing pressure on universities to not do it. Mm. But we'll see. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. 
Um, Rick, I, I love ending my conversation with guests uh, with a more personal question, if you'll indulge. And that is, um, if you can think of a time in your life when you were on the receiving end of empathy that was purposeful uh, and what that meant for you. It's been like it's been like water in the desert. I mean, that's really how it how it feels to me. It's uh, I don't think there is anything more nurturing to the self, or what's what's been more nurturing to me than feeling really known and valued. And I say both of those things. You know, known, valued for things that I value about myself and having people know those things and really value those things and be able to express it. And I feel it when my wife does it, my kids do it, my parents do it, my friends do it. It's a beautiful and profound thing. So um, besides for being a, a basis for justice, I think it's the basis for, for deep human connection. Mm. Do you, you, how old are your children? My kids are now 33, 30, and 27. So they're older. I have a granddaughter who's four years old. I was old. just going to ask. I wasn't yeah. sure whether or not you were in the range of grandparents. So I, I just feel listening to you with the soothing voice and the cadence that you're probably somebody who walks the talk. And I imagine that your children and grandchildren will benefit and thrive as a result. So it was really well, a delight a to meet you. That's a lovely thing to say. Thank you. You seem like somebody who walks the talk too. I'm, and, I, and I'm thrilled you're doing this podcast. And um, I do feel like I do feel like my kids are really good people. And that gives me a great source of pride. So. Sweet. Shout out to your children, Rick. Thank you all for watching and listening. We will see you next week at Purposeful Empathy. Thanks so much for watching another episode of Purposeful Empathy. Please subscribe to my channel. Please consider buying a copy of Purposeful Empathy. Remember, the world needs more empathy and you have a role to play.